All right, welcome back into There Will Be Bourbon. Tonight we have another anonymous account, however, from Twitter. So we will just focus on what he is known as to all of you at Dent McGee on Twitter. He is the Band Aid King. He is the fa- what well, did you fa- did you found? Is it Soul Attack? Yeah, yeah. Are you the founder? I am the founder. He is the founder. He started a first aid company, which you will learn a little bit about tonight. Uh, he is Dent McGee. What's going on, brother? Nothing much. What's going on here? Another day in the shit, man. War as hell. Uh, <laughs> so as you know, this is a show fueled entirely by bourbon for me. And as I go ahead and switch this view, because I am so prepared tonight. Tonight I'm coming with, once again, a, a, a bottom shelf offering from the great Buffalo Trace Distillery. However, Ancient Age, which you can pretty much find everywhere. If you can't, let me know. But this is the same mash bill that produces the higher end stuff from Buffalo Trace, such as all of the Blanton's line, Rock Hill Farms, and the Elmer T. Lee. So if you want to know what it tastes like at four years old, as opposed to some of the more refined and less uh, available options that are ridiculously marked up at this point, just head to your local liquor store, pick up a bottle of Ancient Age. There's also an Ancient Age 10-year, which you may or may not find, but it's out there. It's the same mash bill, as I said, that produces all those things. So try it. But anyway, bro, now I got that out of the way. What, uh, are, you, are you imbibing tonight, or what, what do you got? I'm drinking coffee right now. That's because... right, because you are going to go, you, you are gonna go do some, uh, some oil work, right? Yeah, I have to go back offshore tonight. Okay, so what do, you, what, do, okay what, what do you do? for those of us who do not know anything about the oil industry. So my technical job title is lead operator. So <clears throat> I'm in charge of pretty much just getting oil out of the ground in the cheapest way possible and making okay. sure nobody hurts themselves. <laughs> and at the end of the day, just making sure all the reports are right because seemingly much like the military, people with authority get pissy when the Excel sheets are incorrect. <laughs> okay. So what is the cheapest way to get oil out of the ground? Put a coon ass on location, sir. <laughs> and what is a coon ass for those who don't know? A coon ass is a Cajun, much as myself. <laughs> um, anywhere you go in the world where they're getting oil and gas out of the ground, whether it be Russia, the North Sea, Africa, the Gulf of Mexico, there will be a coon ass somewhere. Really? I promise you this. Okay. Yes. So, so where are you? Where are you from originally? <clears throat> South Louisiana. South Louisiana. Is that where you are today? Is that yes, where sir. You are? Okay. Uh, so, what got you? Well, before we get into that, first of all, if any of the any of you that follow the Band Aid King on Twitter, as like as as I've said, he's carved out a, a significant following in just a short time, in my opinion. Um, but as you know, a few weeks back, he had a tryout. Or he solicited one with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. How'd that go, bro? <clears throat> they, uh, they like my measurables, you know? <laughs> but I just didn't have the arm strength at, at 5'7", a buck 30, you know? 5'7", a buck 30? Because on Twitter, you come off like seven feet tall, bro. So Yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's a thing. Yeah, I, I, I understand. And I didn't want to take up a spot on the practice squad and – you know, mess somebody fair, over. That's so fair. I just decided to call my professional career. I, that's fair. I mean, you, more, you know, Don Beebe size, not Peyton Manning size. It happens, you know. Yeah, there's I only, mean. There's only so many sub six feet quarterbacks in the league. There's one right now, Kyler Murray. Um, Drew Brees. Drew Brees. Baker Mayfield, depending on if you believe how tall he was at the combine. Well, um, I mean, I could have been the next Doug Flutie. There, there, could, be <laughs> dimp, there could be dimp flakes being marketed <laughs> this time next year. but. At 40 years old, you know, it's, it's kind of a – probably not. I mean, you know, there's, there's a market for everything, right? You, you, you got to remember, everyone is familiar with the term broadcasting, but you really got to sometimes worry about narrow casting, right? You want to just find your niche, find your market, and just kill it. And that's kind of what I think you've managed to do on the old Twitter sphere. So now let's, 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 let's figure out a little bit about who the hell Demp is, right? So you've been in the gas – or you've been in the oil industry for 20 years? Uh, since I was 18, so 22 18. years. So 22 years. So what, what, what made you get into that? Was, that, was, was this the option? Was, what so, was Demp doing after he graduated high school and realized, shit, I got to grow up? So uh, my dad put me in the truck one afternoon, and he was like, all right, so you got 
two choices. We can either go to the recruiting office. Hey, or we, you see me. Yeah. Or we can go down Highway 90, which is uh, slang for carrying your little ass offshore. So I decided that I'd rather get yelled at and get paid a little bit more than you guys. Yeah. So <laughs> I went offshore. So that's, that's what I did, and that's what my dad did, and that's what my grandfather did after he got out of the service. So I'm third generation of my family to do oh, this. Wow. Okay. So you've been doing this 22 years, third generation. Um, did they all do it in Louisiana as well, or was they different locations? Or um, My grandfather and my dad went all over the world. Um, <clears throat> my dad ended up being pretty high up in uh, right. an unnamed company. And so he kind of went all over the world and did his thing. And my grandfather was a turbine specialist. And uh, he also went all over the world and did his thing. Um, I had a couple opportunities to go overseas, but with the current climate of things in oh, the yeah. world, um, the places I got offered to go, nah, nah. Cause they were like, you want to go to Africa? No, I do not. But I appreciate <laughs> the offer. Cause at the, at the time they were actually offering like a 50% hazard pay bonus. Nice. We so, don't get 50%. Our hazard pay is like 150 bucks, man. So good for your two, yeah. five, give or take. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Okay. But you get to, you get to carry a rifle and I got to carry a crescent wrench. So <laughs> <laughs> you guys are well protected from what I've been able to see. I did some drive-bys on the way to Baghdad in 2003 during the invasion. And uh, we saw all the oil and gas fields lit on fire. The, the Iraqi army lit them all on fire. So that was an interesting, I got a really great picture somewhere on a hard drive also somewhere that I'm not a hundred percent sure where it's at of all of that burning. So, yeah. and this was pre-digital camera error. I mean, they were out. I just didn't have one. So we, we, we bought like those little, what are those fucking things? The little disposable cameras. I took yeah, a little like picture. Instamatic. Yeah. I took a, I took a bunch of pictures of the oil fields or the, the refine. I don't know what the hell they were. The, they were oil wells. Yeah. Those were all, they, they lit them all on fire to, uh, but it looked great at night, but uh, probably not too well. Um, but yeah, I was going to say like, cause I know, I mean, the main contention with obviously Iraq and Kuwait was most of the oils down in Kuwait. So if you look at a map and you look at Iraq and then you have that little tiny spot on it, that's Kuwait. It's like when they drew up all the lines, it was, it was either post-World War One or pre-World War Two, one of them, or might've been post-World War Two. Anyway, when they drew it all up, it's like, they're almost like, you know what, Iraq, you can have all of that huge mass of territory. And then this little tiny section down here, that's like yeah. the size of Delaware gets all the oil. So yeah, Saddam wasn't happy. So, um, but what well, was, has that ever been something you've tried to explore now that it's been a little safer or no, still not something you want to do? Nah, dude. Like, uh, my boss, my ex boss, uh, got kidnapped twice in Africa. Holy shit. In Africa. Dang. Yeah. Africa is. See, I think Africa is way less secure than the middle east despite whether people realize it or not yeah like i got offered to go to cutter okay for Been a there. couple months so, yeah that makes sense and it just didn't work out i was willing to go to cutter because cutters at the time was pretty safe yeah. and i just it just didn't work out but i actually got offered a job to go like work legitimately 28 and 28 in angola oh and uh talking to my boss he's like i don't know if i'd want to do all that because uh it cost our company like a couple hundred grand to get me back the last time so like there's actually a a contingency like yeah. with like with chevron and shell and bp and total and all these companies that operate in africa there's actually contingency plans all right cool so you got kidnapped go open the safe in this building and get the cash and go pay off this tribe and get your people back and it happens way way more than people think like it's a fairly common occurrence because it's an easy way for them to make money yeah and they yeah. know you're gonna pay it yeah yeah like he told me that like he didn't get treated bad they didn't hit him or beat on him or you know threaten him or anything they just wanted to get paid yeah that sounds very familiar unfortunately um so what so what would it be if you guys go over there what is it that you primarily do? Is it supervisory? Is it the ones actually doing the work or are you guys just kind of overseeing the, the local help? I got to most of the, most of the countries in Africa and even in MENA 
have operating agreements with the companies that say like at least 60 or 70 percent of our employees have to be local you know they have to be okay. from in country right they can't you can't do it like you they did in the 70s and 80s where it's 100 percent expat okay they, they won't let you do that anymore <clears throat> so generally it's in some type of supervisory role um i got to meet a bunch of guys from angola during their training over here mm. um we were setting a bunch of platforms off the coast of angola i got to meet a bunch of the guys they would bring them over here for like six to eight months okay uh put them through like english language classes and you know all of our sops and all this and they were employees of the same company just like me and angolans are really nice people great people very down to earth very cool but as far as like flying to angola and working in angola that'd be a mega negative i mean it's it's there's just too much shit that too much bad stuff that can happen over there you know like especially angola isn't as bad as nigeria right. nigeria is that's the wild wild west right there that's some crazy shit happens in nigeria so uh, you mentioned the training aspect and that's what i was curious about so you, what as you said it's six to eight months that they do that or so what's what's standard for the typical american who's like hey man i want to i want to get in the oil industry what what does a training program look like uh you get it hard yeah. <laughs> really? um you literally the way i got into this is so there's two sides to <clears throat> two sides to the coin pretty much so okay. you got Production, which is what I do now, which is you're actually extracting the oil and gas out of the ground and operating the equipment, separating oil and water, separating gas and water and doing all this stuff. And then you have drilling, which is actually you're drilling the well. And then off to the side sort of is well service. You're like well scum. You are shit. You're the guys that show up and fix the stuff that drilling messed up somehow. <laughs> And you come and do stuff on wells that have already been drilled and all this other stuff. So I actually started in well service. I did like two years in that and figured out very quickly that I liked on my fingers and <laughs> this wasn't for me. Because I legitimately, legitimately, like in South Louisiana, you see a bunch of old retired like drilling guys, I'm gonna be walking around like this. <laughs> <clears throat> Bunch of them so for those who didn't and, see that, he's showing that because we we got we got YouTube and then we have all the streaming service. He's showing that there's potentially you're walking around with not all of your fingers. But anyway, carry on. Correct. And uh, <clears throat> I got lucky. Um, I was working in a field and the production foreman asked me if I wanted to come into production. And <clears throat> it's I'm gonna say like it's rank based. Yeah. In production. So like. Generally, you start as like a C operator. Then you work your way up to a B, then an A, then a lead A, then lead two, lead one. And that's on the contract side. Then when you get in, if you get lucky enough to get hired by a company like Chevron or Shell or BP, they have their own ranking system. And it might be like <clears throat> operator two, operator one, lead operator, senior operator. And it's technically a senior operator can tell anybody below him what to do. And it's. So it sounds very paramilitary like in structure, pay grade. It's, it's, like it's, you earn your way in terms yeah, of rank and it, pay grades, right? It, it's, it's a meritocracy. Yeah. And, as and, it should be. And like, if you put it in your time and like, don't kill anybody or hurt anybody or hurt yourself a whole lot. <laughs> and don't put oil in the water because that invites the United States Coast Guard to come visit, and that's never a fun time. You work your way up. So, I mean, in 22 years, it took me, shit. It probably took me 15 years to make lead one. No, I was lead two contract hand. And then I got hired by a bigger company, by a really, really, really big company. And then uh, worked from there. So are, are those other, all, all those companies, are they competitive with each other's employees or is this something where there, there's like, you know, minor leagues, major leagues type thing where they're scouting or what? Um, so like if you're contract, you're just contract. So okay. you're working for a third party company operating on like, like 
you might work for a company called Dano Securo on a shell platform and might be making $18 an hour, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing the same work that a shell hand is making $38 an hour on the same platform. But your contract and heat shell, that's a big company contract thing. It used to be a big thing. They do like this. They show you their bat. They show yeah. you the patch, you know? Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> a good contract game will eventually get hired. Most nine times out of ten. Um, or they'll just keep bumping him up in pay until he makes pretty good money. I mean, right. there's nowhere else in the world, nowhere else and no other industry in the world where you can take an 18- or 19-year-old kid with barely a high school education and send him offshore and make the money that we do. Because, I mean, <clears throat> like, you might only be making, like, so let's say in, like, 2008, you was making $10 an hour, but that's 40 hours at 10, then 44 hours at 15, because our basic week is 84 hours, period. That's, that's our minimum amount of work. What? Yes. We work 12 hours a day for seven days or 12 hours a day for 14 days or 12 hours a day for 28 days, how, depending on how long your hitch is. Jesus. So <clears throat> you take an 18, 19 year old kid and all of a sudden he's bringing home eight, 900 bucks a month in 2008. That's, that's, yeah. that's real money. Hmm. Plus all your insurance and everything. And well, you're Louisiana, all yeah, I would say it, it costs a living that that's important. Yeah. And you're off half of the year. You're off. So I work 14 and 14. So I literally work six months out of the year. But you don't get paid when you're not working. No, no, okay. I do not. That's what I'm saying. So, okay. That, 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 yeah. Cause I remember you and I had a conversation about this a, a several weeks back, but um, at what point, cause I mean, you've been doing this 22 years. Do you see a lot of turnover? Or is this something people stick with? Nobody wants to come do it anymore. None of the younger really? guys. Yeah. It's why? Because it's hard work, man. I mean, it's fair. People don't want to work hard, essentially. They, the API, the American Petroleum Institute, actually put out a white paper on it maybe seven or eight years ago. It's called The Grain of the Oil Field. The Grain of the Oil Field. I need to look this up. And <clears throat> what it is essentially is that without an influx of new blood, that all of your experienced guys, the guys that have the know-how, the guys that have done it for 20, 30, 40, 50 years are just retired. There's no reason for them to stay anymore. They've reached retirement age. And so you, and I'm not, I'm not trying to knock like the younger generation, but a lot of the younger guys we get, they just, they just don't cut it. I mean, like it's, it's hard work. It, but it's, so, but, but I get that. And I get that because I, I hear it's not just, it's not restricted only to your industry, but I, I'm trying to figure out. So in your opinion, where does that come from? Because let's, let's be honest. You, you, you are 40. Yeah. Okay. I turned 40 in December. So whoever we're talking about as this next generation, whether it's our kids or not, it's our kids, right? For if we're, if, if we're being big picture on, on our, the people our age that are who are raising children at this moment, we're the ones responsible. Now, my parents, they would tell you the same thing. Like they, they have issues with my generation and ours, right? And it's, so it's, it's generational. But at the end of the day, we're the ones raising them. So where do you feel, in your opinion, or what do you see, given your experience and your viewpoint of new people coming on, why do you think they don't make it? Aside from the fact that it's hard work, I got that. But why do you think they're not cut out for it? I think, I think a lot of younger people... <laughs> And I could be totally wrong. A lot of younger people aren't willing to submit to a higher authority mm. and be fair. explicitly told, you're going to do this now, or you're going to be fired, or I will send you home. I will run you off. That's your choices. There are no other, there's no discussion. There's no debate. Either do your fucking job. Oops, sorry. Do no, your you job. You cuss, you cuss all day. Uh, <laughs> do, your fucking, do your fucking job or get on the fucking boat and go the fuck home. And that's, that's, literally the end the end of it yeah and i don't think a lot of i don't think a lot of younger people have ever been have really ever been spoken to like that they don't they don't know what it's like to be hollered at you know i mean like i agree 
they're, they've never been busted down and just been like, you dumb son of a bitch. What did you mess up now? And shit like that. And they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to be like, all right, cool, got it, whatever. Just blow it off or cool. I'm going to do better next time. They're just like, ah, fuck it. I'm going to go home. So they go home. Um, yeah. Um... And it's changed in the oil field too. Um, I'm sure it's changed in the military that like oh, yeah. we're not supposed to talk to people like that anymore. And like we can't haze. Hazing used to be a huge thing. In huge, huge. Really? What? Oh my god. Yes, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh yes. Oh yeah. We used to haze the shit out of kids. Um I got hazed. My dad yeah, I was got gonna hazed. say, let's let's uh, maybe put that down for later. Hazing. <laughs> All right, go ahead. It I mean some of the shit I don't agree with, but yeah. a lot of it was you separated out who was willing to stay there right off the top, you know? Mm. And we've just moved towards like a kinder, gentler workforce. And this is not an industry that is a, that works with a kinder, gentler workforce. It's the old saying used to be like when my dad was doing it was men of iron platforms made of wood. I mean, and that's we we've transitioned to this to this new school stuff and like i have to go through all kinds of like charm school training i actually got sent to charm school twice because i yelled at people and it's <laughs> i did it was fucking horrible so really go when, ahead when when in your industry did you see this shift then because what you've been doing for 22 years, I've been doing what I've been doing for 18, and I can I can definitely point out a shift, and I can pinpoint when. But I'm just curious in your line, where did you see it, or when did you first notice it? Because it may have been going on, but you were too young to maybe not you know notice. But now you're older, wiser. But probably probably like mid 2000s it got like really really yeah what do you know the mid 2000s yeah it got like funny how that works yeah it got it got really out of hand like we were spending more time in just these ridiculous training sessions and all this and like diversity councils and getting on it it just got to where like our number one job wasn't getting oil out of the ground at a cheap price, which is what I'm here for, but right. making sure that I checked all the boxes, you know, on this diversity thing and this how to talk to people thing. And it just, it got ridiculous. Um, and there was no choice, but I'm sure as in your industry, there was no choice but to go along with it and make yeah, the best. You gotta, yeah, yeah, it's either go along or get out, but yeah. not really get out because you got a contract and yeah. I got you. I, I'm with you. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's if you get away from the bigger companies and work for like, like mom and pop, right? Oil right. Gas, ones that are trying to either establish a name or ones that are just right. No, I got that. But I mean, you, yeah, you don't have that option where I come from. But it it kind of is what it is. But I can tie back to essentially what you said. You you pinpointed a time a time. And I would agree wholeheartedly with the things that I saw. But I would also say, honestly, man, I hate to say this because it's just such a, it, it's such an, it's a, it's, it's like an anvil on the, on the, just hanging around the necks of us. And I would say it, it ties into two things, the rise and the re- reliance on the internet and then the prevalence going back to about 2012, 2013 of social media where we decided to accept it. Where we, so the Department of Defense said they, they came to a de- decision point back then where it's either, hey, because it was still very strict. You weren't allowed to have social media or they were because this stuff started had, there was such a proliferation of social media that it was like, we either, we'd either ban it all or we just let everybody have it all. And they decided to let everybody have it all. And now you kind of have what you have. Um, and when we put this huge reliance on the internet, like literally everything gets blasted out in a fucking email. And like, I, I've told this story to a few people, like there are days literally where I will open my inbox on my email and I just want to, I just want to throw my computer off the fucking bridge <laughs> because of the shit that I read it. 
<laughs> and I don't know how that works in your industry, but I mean, all of this training and the stuff that you highlight, it's all tied together because everything's a fucking PowerPoint, man. There's, there's no like actual training. It's. Oh, I can assure you that the oil field loves PowerPoint <laughs> as much as the United States military. I guarantee you. Like, I spent literally months of my life. If, if cumulatively months of my life watching PowerPoint and it's, it's in case any future employees are watching, employers are watching. It's fucking great. And I love it. And I really like learning all this new stuff, but between betwixt me and you, it's a fucking Twix. ginormous, <laughs> ginormous waste of time because I mean, after like the fourth slide, everybody just tunes out. They're just like, God, when, when is this shit over with? And that's been my experience. Maybe yours is different. No, not at all. Which I, um, I would say that the problem with PowerPoint is what it, what it does is it, it, I think PowerPoint in its uh, original intent was designed to provide a visual confirmation of what you were being instructed. That's it. However, what people have done with it is gotten entirely too fucking cute They've turned it into a fucking art class with, oh, look at my PowerPoint skills and look how I can design all these little charts. Same with Excel, like fucking, oh, let me throw a pivot point chart in here. What, you know, this, yeah. all this crazy shit. Um, and the instructors no longer instruct. They literally, even though it's, it's taught to you from like the first hour of, you know, the military or the, you know, let's keep it at the military. The first hour of the instructor course is never to read the slide, but all the people do is read the slide. Right. So it's like, all right, you have a slide or, or it's, or it's gotten to the point where we'll just email out the slides, read them yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, that's the training that goes on. And unfortunately what I think it does is I think it all has, I think it has a reverse effect of what the desired outcome is. You want to bring attention and highlight important things that should probably be noted or made aware to you in your specific industry. But when you beat them to death, you lose the desired effect, right? Now I get yeah. it. You need to have certain training for certain things. Got it. I don't, I don't need to have the same exact training every quarter. I don't. The only thing I should be doing every quarter, which I don't, is fire my weapon. That's what I should be doing. Or <laughs> as we transition from that into what it is you do with your company Maybe I should be proficient in, you know, I don't know, performing fucking combat life-saving skills or basic first aid on the battlefield. All right. I should do that once a quarter. I don't. I don't. I'm not saying people don't. I'm just saying I don't. Okay. Now, yeah. let's transition out and I'll probably come back to it because, I, I, man, I could talk about the fucking vet industry because it sounds – there's like a, a duality, I think, between us and the military <laughs> or the military and you guys and then uh, just – I have so many other questions. I'm definitely going to come back to it, but let me transition real quick because as we said, you are the Band-Aid King on Twitter. And I would love to know a, why you started a first aid company and B where your, 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 I guess, I guess it's expertise, but where, where did your training or what, what, what propelled you to do so? So, um, <clears throat> Why did I start Soul Attack? Um, so That's a great name, Soul Attack. Which I ordered a first aid kit. I'm waiting for it to get here. Thank Should you, here. brother. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, so I got to looking around. Like when I started, like not so much like prepping, just like yeah, getting, yeah, yeah. just getting kit and stuff like that together. I started looking around at what what was available on the market and who was selling it and it, what the prices were and what the actual contents were. And just like people were getting fucked like really bad. Mm. Like apparently a hundred dollar IFAC full of paper tape and band-aids sells like hotcakes on Amazon. And I just and looked at the real quick. So for those who don't know, an IFAC is an individual first aid kit, but go ahead. Yes. Right. <laughs> and <clears throat> like I just wasn't cool with that. So yeah. We started but looking it sells. around. And you know what? I don't, I mean, I'm going to cut this off, man, but let me just bring this back to the bourbon aspect. Cause this is a show called there will be bourbon. It's the same thing he's saying. 
You got $20 fucking bottles of bourbon because all you nerds got interested in it. You drove up the price to three, $400 for a fucking $20 bottle of bourbon. If you guys do that same thing to this, we're going to have some conversations. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so, <laughs> like, and when I, when I looked at the contents, like, they're marketing them as, like, military-style IFACs. And if you go look at, like, Yep. the army directive or the marine corps directive or even the navy directive on what's supposed to be in their ifac it's nothing close they just slammed a bunch of shit from china in there yep bundle it up and they're selling them like it's going out of style at 100 bucks a pop all day long so <clears throat> i looked around and saw what was available and what i could bring to market based on what i had used and everything and just not fuck over people yeah. and that was the genesis of Soul Attack, like to offer good kit at a competitive price and just have really good customer service and just not fuck people over. And so was 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 did it did it come from anything you were doing specifically in your in in the actual oil industry, or was it just this is a specific? This is a totally separate interest of yours that you've just cultivated. No, I part of one of my jobs. I wear many hats offshore. <laughs> Um, one of my jobs I'm sure is also to be the medic. Um, okay. Instead of when I worked for super ginormous oil and gas company headquartered somewhat around where you're sitting right now, <laughs> <laughs> um, we run our own, or we ran our own private EMS and fire service. Um, we had our own accredited schools for EMS and fire. like. They didn't send you to Texas A&M Fire School. They sent you to ginormous oil and gas fire school and ginormous oil and gas EMS school. And what they developed was <clears throat> almost like a hybrid class of essentially they took the old EMTI intermediate, took about 70% of it, then took the Coast Guard medical health care provider stuff, slammed it all together and shoved it in your brain in like seven or eight days. Damn. <clears throat> and that's how we became medics. Um, <clears throat> on land, I can't do much. I can like hand you a Band-Aid and watch you die on the side of the road. Um, offshore, I, knew I can't do as much as I could with ginormous oil and gas. Um, with ginormous oil and gas, I could push drugs, everything except pain meds, pretty much. Um, with my new employer, um, smallish oil and gas. Um, I can't do as much, but I can still do a lot. And it's because of the, somewhere long ago, they found a loophole in the Coast Guard and federal law or some shit. And that allows us to operate higher than what our certification level would be on land. And so like at work, I can start an IV, I can do all that shit here. Nah. Looks like you had a bad day. <laughs> so if I'm understanding it, you have a, you have no, like, I guess, civilian accreditation to do anything offshore. No, I'm certified. I'm certified by the Louisiana Bureau of Emergency Medicine. Okay. But you said you, you can only pretty much hand out a fucking band aid. You can't treat and shit or. <clears throat> Okay, that's where that gray area shit comes in. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I carry a, on land, I carry a Louisiana State first responder EMS okay. license. All right. Gotcha. Okay. Once I get offshore, wherever Coast Guard, United States Coast Guard has jurisdiction, I fall under, because on land, obviously, your Coast Guard certification isn't going to count for shit. Once I get offshore and I can, wherever Coast Guard has jurisdiction, then like that whole gray area opens up and I can do like kind of whatever I want to a certain extent. Mm. Um, and like I said, it's because a long time ago, somebody found a gray area and yep. they found out that it was cheaper to train us than to hire a fucking paramedic and have him sit on his ass and do reports okay. all day. Yep. So <clears throat> um, that's, that's literally how I got into it. Um, I got into it because they were paying us an extra 50 cents an hour to be a medic back in the day. <laughs> That's awesome. 
<laughs> That's awesome. So an extra 20 bucks a week, you were like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do this. Yeah. And um, it, it was it was really cool. Um, I got to meet a lot of cool people and mm. literally the best instructor of any class I've ever taken in my life was our initial EMS instructor. Um, awesome guy, knew how to teach, knew his shit. Um, got to travel a little bit and like go to conferences and stuff. And it just, it just worked out. It just worked out really well. And ultimately it led to us building solo attack. So does that name have any meaning or what, what made you come up with solo attack? Well, because much as you know, anything with tactical on it is fucking hotness. That's right. So, that is true. But, <laughs> so it's Sola, which is South Louisiana. Tactical, okay. Tactical. South Louisiana. Ah, tactical. got it. That does make sense now. Okay. That's and cool uh, shit, man. we didn't, honestly, we didn't expect it to be as big of a success as it, as it is, but it's turned into a quite quite a quite a success it's, and is that driven largely based on the the following you've been able to create from twitter yes it's right. from probably 80 percent of our customers are active duty boys okay law enforcement um i've shipped kits to italy ship kits other places overseas um and it, it's a joke with my wife i'm gonna see one of these like Middle East OSINT accounts and I'm going to see some <laughs> some dude with his face blurred out with a solo attack blowout kit and I'm just going <laughs> to laugh my ass off um, but yeah you guys um, you guys are primarily like our main customers really it really is yeah but that, that I mean what's cool about that and what's cool about our entire network that you know obviously you obviously are a part of it, but you, you've seen like how that network has kind of grown and expanded, but it's not only just us supporting each other. Cause at the end of the day, like we can't, nothing that any of us do is enough based on like the core, right? You have yeah. to expand outside of it, but because you know, there's people like yourself with excess of 5,000 followers and others who have that, the reach is pretty fucking vast for free when it comes down to what you think, you know, in terms of promoting something or, or whatever, like, you know, when when you retweet a link that I post to a fucking podcast that I can see the drive of the traffic, right? Like people do actually respond to those things. So I think that's really cool, man. It's just, and that's what I think also is like these, these weekly things we do with the goons, man, it, it, it's a fucking network that's there. You look at some of the work these guys are doing with this Alan cash thing for the Medal of honor. Like that's fucking cool as shit, but that started with just, you know, Nick was like drunk one night and posting about it. And it's like, Oh, why don't we do this? And it's fucking, here we are, you know, lobbying yeah. the Senate. <laughs> yeah. but that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. We went from hashtag into calling congressmen and senators and stuff. And it, I it, mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool shit, man. I mean, like <clears throat> talking about the network and stuff, it, it's y'all have been awesome to us. I mean, for real, uh, First of all, for accepting me, accepting me as a dirty civilian into the little. Yeah, that's what I noticed, man. I was like, man, Dem's been there since fucking day one. And that's why when I asked you, I was like, oh, shit. Because I always thought, honestly, I thought you were just some fucking guy who was a medic and got out and went into fucking oil. I was like, oh, shit, he's a medic. But no. when you're an actual medic. You just, you're your own <laughs> medic, which is pretty, yeah. which is even cooler, I think, because. Um, but but y'all, I mean, like, y'all bringing me in and accepting me and being cool with me. Yeah, and, I would say that's probably. I would probably say that I had to go all the way back to to when Nick was, you know, Nick on. on yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's on there, the but he was out in the open. Man. He must have found you at some point. But no, that's cool shit, man. So, um, I want to bring it back to something that I wrote down here. What's so you brought? <laughs> so you brought up uh, the prepping thing. When did you when did you get into that? Like, what was there something that you like sparked your interest? Was it something you always wanted to do or I just, <clears throat> especially now when it's being so it's fucking impossible like no one can just start prepping at this point it's too late yeah um <laughs> as I, I know very well in california <laughs> um i don't think it was like any certain event or anything like that i just it's kind of what you're talking well yeah i mean like growing up as a coon ass i mean like 
you kind of always kind of prep in a little bit. But I mean, especially we live in Hurricane Central. I live 30 miles away from the Gulf of yeah. Mexico. Grew up in Orlando, man. I get it. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it wasn't any specific event or anything like that. Um, just decided maybe it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have a little bit of medical and just spare rounds hanging around and, you know, maybe a three day bag and a go bag and yeah. all this other stuff. And that was, that was, that was it. And then that's obviously, you know, led to some of the stuff with the company and all, but, uh, what do you think, what would be the best advice you could give to someone who is like responding, I guess, kind of to the climate, you know, the, the, the current mood of the, in the, in the state of the country, what would your, what would your advice be to someone? Where should they start? Oh man. Um, with a limit let's let and and let's not assume that they're you know fucking tim cook at apple who's got billions of dollars at his disposal let let this someone like yourself or myself like you know someone in the military or you know a a, a dude who just works his ass off where should that guy start i would start with a reliable firearm that isn't going to break the bank i mean even if it's like a ruger 1022 it, it might be a 22 but it still goes bang you know yep. and 22 is everywhere um my next might be the my, only ammunition you can buy at this point that's it's it's insane right now i've never seen shit like this um my second piece of advice would be to get medical training um at least basic first aid and that was one of the reasons i actually went and got my my instructor's certification mm-hmm. for first aid and all that um that way you know, I could teach my family and I could teach yeah. my friends and all this. Um, I'm not going to get off in the weeds about like particular parts of kid and like, yeah, you need to go get a plate carrier and a chest rig, and <laughs> drop leg and all this shit. Fuck all that. Just <clears throat> have a gun you have confidence in and enough rounds to make you go pew for a while. <laughs> um, if you're prepared to make holes, be prepared to fix holes. That's that, a great line. Yep. You, you, you've said that a few times. I like that. That's a good line. Um, I mean, and just it, the whole prepping thing. I mean, like, it's so easy to get off, like, way out in left field. Oh, yeah. And get out in the weeds with it and be building Faraday cages in your spare bedroom and <laughs> stuff like that and just all kind of crazy shit. But, I mean, just if you really want to know, ask your great-grandparents or – if if you have a family member that lived through the depression, ask them. Or through war. I mean, through the Second World War when they had victory gardens and all that stuff like that. Ask them. They'll tell you exactly what you need to do. I think that's a that's an excellent point, especially because when we think about that generation, um they lived they all lived in the cities for the most part back then. You know, there are people like who, who you know, maybe your grandfather and us other, but um, I think people didn't really spread out and create the whole, the suburbs until post-World War II, right? You know, the GI Bill yeah. was used to, to send those men to college and uh, it kind of created the entire suburbs. If you go back and look at suburbs in this country, most of them were built in the 50s and 60s. And there's a very obvious and logical correlation as to why. But yeah, man, I, I would say kind of what you're talking about is, uh, and Clay talks about this in his book if you haven't read it um i got it right over there the concrete jungle but for those of you who are in apartments or you're you're in dense population areas in major cities uh, like myself uh there are some severe limitations but i think what you're talking about is 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 stuff that everyone can kind of do even in those environments like you can get a firearm you can get medical training you can get a medical kit uh, what Clay talks about is, uh, I think from what I've read in the book, I mean, I, I finished the book over the weekend. What I deduce from the book is you're not really, I guess, prepping f- for the end of the fucking world. You're just prepping for like, Hey man, there's, you might be a rough spot for a week or two weeks before hey. shit kind of, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I can look back my own history and when Katrina hit, I mean, yeah, that's that's valid. Yeah, how was that? That fucking sucked. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually evacuated to Hattiesburg, 
<laughs> thinking we oh, were damn, doing the right thing. Mississippi, shit. And Katrina came right up I-59 and fucked Hattiesburg up. And um, we decided to leave after somebody got shot in the face over a bag of ice. And we were like, <laughs> like yeah, it's probably time to get out of here. So we just kind of went back home. And uh, But well, like what little – and I, I – Prepping hadn't even begin, yeah, begun yeah. to pop into my head back then. But even what little bit I did have set aside, like I had some old MREs and a couple of cases of water set aside. You know, mm-hmm. that shit came in super handy. And I learned to hate MREs very soon after that because the government <laughs> was handing them out like Halloween candy yeah. to everybody. And they fucking suck. They're horrible. They got Halloween. candy in them though. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Hey, if you get jalapeno cheese, cheese, you're good. You're good, man. You're golden. Wow. Actually, my favorite part of the MREs was like the little sweet bread, like cake thing about this big. Yeah, yeah. So what like, people like? So and and uh, man, it's been a few years since I've had MREs, so I just don't fucking have to have them anymore. But I remember when I went to Afghanistan, they came out with some new flavors, and this was back in 2013, 2014. There was buffalo chicken, which I don't even know if they still make anymore. But when I went into Iraq in 2003, the funniest shit we used to get. Um, Beef stew is still the, the goat, but they would have the charms. I don't even think they have charms in them anymore. Those little hard candies, the little hard fucking fruit flavored candies. Man, we would give those things to those little Iraqi kids. Those fuckers would start wars over those over charms. Yeah. If you you go back and look, I think it's called the bully of Baghdad or some shit. It's like these old YouTube videos of this like fat ass little 10 year old Iraqi <laughs> boy just beating the hell out of people for MRE candy. It's, it's nuts. There's some crazy shit on the internet. Um, so is it the army or the marines with the charms? No, no. No, no. I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for the marines. I, I mean, yeah, I, I heard it. Was, I heard it was bad juju to have charms. I mean, anything in the marines that is not crayon flavored is <laughs> is bad juju. Okay, so don't listen to anything they say. They're still bitter about the fact that no one needs them for anything. But wow. <laughs> um, no, I don't even think they I, – I, I haven't seen Charms in about, you know, fucking 12, 13 years. I don't think they have any more. But there is, a, there is one out there that's still ah, – Skittles is still in there. And there used to be Reese's Pieces. Not sure if those are still around. I could take some Reese's, Reese's Pieces. Oh, Reese's is the, is the greatest – anything Reese's is – that's the greatest thing you could ever have. See, but the, the greatest – the best thing that happened about all that, I ain't going to say the best thing because it's a shitty, like, year. Like we were getting pallets of MREs sent to us offshore. Oh, Our, shit. oh yeah, you were still fucking working back then. Like Yeah. Oh, that's another story. Okay, go. So, and then we'll come back to it. So like our company, because we didn't have any electricity or anything like that offshore, they would send us offshore with like cases of water and shit loads of MREs. Well, these dudes were eating like three or four MREs a day and gaining weight like a big dog. And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. I'm, I'm, I'm getting fat. I was like, dude, that's like 7,000 calories in an MRE. Oh, I yeah. Think supposed, I think you're supposed <laughs> to eat like one a day and drink a shitload of water, and you're smashing like four of them every day. And that was after that year or so. I, I, don't even, I, don't, I do not even own not one piece of the MRE anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, man, let me ask you this shit. So – what, was it tw- was it Shell that had that big ass fucking gas or oil leak years ago? That was BP. B- okay, the BP. That's the one. Okay, Shell had that a big was, one, but that wasn't that was, near the. That was, that was Deepwater Horizon. Yes. What the this, hell? How, this, what was that like? Uh, I watched it burn. Oh, it's fucking nuts. I still remember that shit. I I remember it like every news station had like a camera just watching it. Like Come where out I work, the water man. That, where I work now, we're about like 30, 40 miles away from there. And it would burn bright enough at night to where you'd like, you could go outside and read the, read the newspaper. It's fucking insane. What, yeah. So what happened? How did that, what, what was the cause of that? <clears throat> um, whew, like how technical you want to get. Okay. So, <laughs> um, they lost well control, essentially. Okay. Easiest way to put it. They lost well control. And they had a kick. A kick is when, so the way you drill a modern oil, we're going to get in some weeds here now. Let's do it. Let's get weedy. All right. (laughs) So the way you drill a modern oil well is called underbalanced. So you have 
so many thousands of feet of drill pipe and you have mud in it mm-hmm. and your mud has a certain weight because you're constantly circulating it and it does three things it provides weight to the work string it cools the bit and it brings the cuttings back up to the surface because you're constantly circulating right so by drilling underbalanced <clears throat> you're drilling with less weight than you're anticipating seeing in pressure. So you're banking that you have enough weight, just barely enough to overcome the pressure that you're going to see when you hit that formation. And you do that on purpose because you can drill faster. Okay. Um, <clears throat> whenever they had the kick, the gas came up, the BOPs, which are blowout preventers, just I mean, there's been literal congressional investigations about this shit. Essentially, like, the worst case scenario happened. Mm -hmm. They got natural gas in the generator building on a rig. Everything started coming up the hole, and they couldn't control it, and it caught on fire. And um, much like on a ship, because that's essentially uh, deep water horizon was in, like, trying to remember, maybe 4,500 foot of water, 5,000 foot of water. Um, It's essentially a ship, and it's classified by the Coast Guard as a ship. And um, much like on a ship, the worst thing that could ever happen is fire. And once it lit off, that it was was over with. There was was no stopping it. Um, They... I remember when they first start trying, started trying to do some interventions and stuff, like injecting golf balls and cut up tires and shit, just trying to slow it down. Because at one point they were putting like tens of thousands of barrels overboard out of that well um, a day. Um, and they ended up finally drilling two relief wells. They actually like, so the well bore is like this. They drilled a relief well into here, a relief well into here. And it started pumping cement and shit to try and stop it. And that's eventually how they got it stopped. So all that oil that was coming up, that, that's what caught on fire? Yes, sir. Gee, that's fucking... Like, um, I, that's just, I just remember, I remember it, and like I said, as, as they, would, they would broadcast that, and I just remember thinking, like, what the... Like, like what do you um, do? And then, but that, that's interesting. You said that you talked about the relief wells and all. It's just like, yeah, what, what the hell, what, what's the, is there a playbook um, for this or? Yes. That, um, once it gets on the water, you can do three different things. You can try, no, well, I'm not going to count, but you can try <laughs> and re, you, you try and recover it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Or you can let natural wave action and weather dissipate it. A little bit of crude oil on the water will actually go away on its own because the largest polluter of the Gulf of Mexico is the Gulf of Mexico itself because it's natural seeps. The largest polluter of any ocean with oil in the world is the ocean itself. All right. So you can let it dissipate naturally or you can set it on fire. And that's in the, that's what the Coast Guard ended up doing. They were taking a uh, gallon jugs of diesel they wrap them with dead cord and put a cap on it and light the oil on fire. Is that just because it wasn't salvageable or does it seem like? Because there was so fucking much of it. They put, I'd have, you, I'd have to look it up, dude, but it, it was yeah. hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil. It was a lot. There was so much oil. We were, like I said, like 30, 40 miles away. <clears throat> and the deck of my platform where I worked at the time was probably 50 feet off the water. Okay. You could take an onion and drop it off my platform and we hit the oil and stop and then it would sink very slowly there's probably six there's probably six eight inches of oil on the water and it got so bad that they actually came out and uh they put benzene monitors on all the structures that were manned because the oil you know as it degrades it gives off benzene and if the benzene readings got too high they would come and get you off That's insane. So how, how many months after that happened was it finally like it back to normal, I guess? It's it, it's still not. We still it's, do it's, we still deal with it. Like with the repercussions of it. Um so like <clears throat> there 
the agency in charge of like our police okay mm -hmm. yeah belongs to doi department of interior okay yep and part of it belongs to dot department of transportation because we're transporting product through pipelines well the part of the police that actually come out and inspect used to be called mms which was minerals management service they got their ass kicked over this because um i'm not i guess you can look it up i'll put it to you that way i don't want to i don't want to talk out of school about everything right, that happened yeah, no that's fair gotcha and there's there's still people getting sued over this shit um but they kind of maybe dropped the ball a little bit and all this bad shit happened and it there was a definite culture change after that was 2010 there's a so, definite definite some, culture change so more powerpoint since then L less powerpoints <laughs> more fines more inspections like we used to get inspected once a year now we get inspected probably two or three four times a year um and the crazy thing about so like like if you worked offshore mm -hmm. okay and i showed up to your platform they've changed their name since then now it's bessie it's bsee -E, bureau of safety and environmental sign whatever anyway so if you worked offshore <coughs> and i showed up and i found you in what's called a willful violation okay something like a p103 which is you have purposely bypassed a safety device to continue production not only is a company going to be fined but you personally can be fined up to forty-six thousand dollars a day per violation and if people get hurt and are killed or if there's pollution from that you're subject to criminal prosecution so you could be a 20 year old operator and have bessie land and you were doing some stupid shit and you were on the hook for some major major money and perhaps your freedom so given uh, uh, on what you just said there like uh what's I mean, I know it's kind of nefarious to talk about, but how how often do serious injuries and things like that take place? Because I would imagine this is not a, a safe, completely safe. You can't mitigate everything, right? No. Um, get them. <laughs> gotta get her to make me a cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> Baby, get that coffee. That's right. Um, <laughs> so... <clears throat> just personally um i've been a medic for like 12 years i've got like 600 or so patient contacts 600, 12 years okay and which is way less than your average like truck medic yeah but i've got like probably 50 kilo medevacs um Damn. most of our injuries um are like people's hands and fingers and feet committing suicide in front of hammers and heavy things oh, um a lot of our stuff is because we're talking about the graying of the oil field so yep. the average age offshore is getting older and older and older with that comes the health problems of older people like high blood pressure diabetes shit like that um more of my stuff lately has been way way more medical and especially with this covid bullshit yeah. um a lot more medical um i mean i get just like your average ems station down the street i get calls from everything to where like he cut his arm open to some dude has a toothache it's 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 ridiculous and um as far as serious injuries goes so let's say you fucked around and killed somebody the federal government is about to step off in your ass there's going to be what's called a district investigation. And that's going to go, that's not your average inspectors. That goes all the way to district. So you got New Orleans district, Lafayette district, and Homa district. <clears throat> and once Bessie gets a hold of you, they have, we're subject to 30 CFR 250. So there's a whole CFR written just for what I do every day. And once Bessie gets a hold of you, they have a hold of you. And you can be subpoenaed. You can be everything. It's it's a big fucking deal. Even a serious injury 
can start a district investigation. It's it, it turns into a big deal, and we're talking about like culture shifts and culture changes. Yep, yep. You know, used to it was a wild west. Like my dad told me stories about, yeah, we killed a boy one day and we wrapped him up in visqueen and we put him in the cooler until the grocery boat came three days later, which is completely believable because this was in the seventies. You know, that was wild west. Now, dude, we have to report everything. Like even if you were on my platform and you got sick, no injury. I have to call Bessie and report it. I have to call and say, hey, Aaron got sick. We had to send him in. We're waiting on word. So do you think this has helped your guys' work performance or is it hindering? <clears throat> and if that's not something you want to answer, let me know and we'll move it's, on. But... <clears throat> no, it's, it's helped because, I mean, nobody wants to see anybody get hurt. Right. Um, it slowed things down tremendously um, as far as, like, There used to be a, like, even when I started in 98, there used to be a very big thing about, like, no matter what, fuck it, we're going to get the job done. Mm. And that's changed a thousand percent. It's now it's, if we can't do it safely, we're not going to do it, period. Um, and that's even dealing with the inherent risk in what we do every day. Because I literally live, sleep, wash my ass, watch TV on a, on a bomb. It, it's literally what it is. Um, and there have been new regulations that come out. They've added to the CFR. Um, inspection frequency has increased and all this other stuff. And the, it's not a money-making venture for the government, even though they make a shit ton of money off of it. Mm -hmm. Because I'll let you in on a fun fact. Fun fact. Here we go. The federal government takes approximately 30% of every barrel of oil made in the Gulf of Mexico. Once it's sold or in terms of... Oh, like, no. As soon as you get it out the ground, you would fit in to pay Uncle Sam, cousin. 30%. It averages from 25 to 35%. I don't know what Pacific OCS is because you also have some platforms on the West Coast. West Coast. Mm. But, yeah, the federal government go take their cut. Then, when they come inspect you, if it's considered a complex structure, which is, I think, 10 or more wells, they charge you 3600 bucks a pop for them to come inspect you and find you. It, it's the best racket I've ever, I call them revenue agents. So, yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the modern day version of it, right? <laughs> it's insane. And the amount of power, dude, the amount of power that Bessie has, it would, I've never heard of that organization until you told me about it tonight. That's crazy. Who goes into, who goes into work for them? Is that, is it people ex, that ex coasties and ex Navy boys? Okay. That makes sense. I was wondering yeah. if it was more people who came from your line of work. Used to, but, yes. Yeah. But now it's a lot of guys that are fresh out of the service, especially the Coasties and the Navy. Government because you have to be able to carry a clearance ah, to, be, gotcha. to be employed by Bessie. Right. That um, makes sense, I guess. I mean, I don't know if it makes sense, but I get it. They already have them. They get out of the service with them. So. Yeah. And the, the, the bad thing about the, the younger guys is, is – they're very by the book based instead of being like really? an older guy. Wow, dude. If it's in that book, it better be like that. And CFR 250 is fucking big. There's a lot of, a lot of shit in there. Um, See, that's weird of, because when we go back to what we originally talked about, about why this generation won't cut it in or somehow some don't, I would think it would be the opposite in a way because. Yeah, but. You just gave a 26-year-old dude an almost unlimited amount of power. Mm -hmm. He can literally, at a word, shut in a facility that makes 125,000 barrels a day. Just like that. You're out of compliance. Shut this facility in now. And you have no choice but to do it. So does the – so because I'm curious. I, I'm trying to read the political angle on this. Um because it sounds like there's a, a financial incentive for the government to work with you rather than against you. There is. Especially um, in the modern climate, I think when we're trying to become more energy or more energy independent. Well, technically, yeah. we, are, we are energy independent. We're a net, net exporter now. Um, the, 
the bad thing is that not oils are not all oils are the same. So, okay, this is good. I like this. I'm learning. <laughs> so along the Gulf Coast, where the Gulf Coast has approximately like 70, 75 percent oil refining capacity in the United States of America, and the Gulf Coast refineries <clears throat> are set up to process heavy, sweet crude, um, like oil from Venezuela, shit like that. Okay, <clears throat> you're everybody's about oh Saudi, 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 Saudi. Yeah. Saudi's crude oil fucking sucks ass. It's horrible shit. It's full of sulfur, and it does not command the same price. You actually have to blend it to make it palatable to be able to refine it into higher end products. Um, a lot of Middle Eastern oil is like that, and that's uh, something that a lot of people. Uh, Probably the majority of Americans do not realize it. Like hundred percent, that 90, no, ninety nine percent because you you're an American and you realize this. So yeah, ninety nine percent, man. But yeah, <laughs> Middle a lot of Middle Eastern never heard of this shit until now. Sulfur, I wonder. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, keep going. So a lot of Middle Eastern crude sucks, and so it cuts into your refining margins. So you're not making as much money to make gasoline or diesel or whatever it may be out of this crude oil. So why would you want it? So that's why they set up to refine like heavier crudes. Um, so there's probably 40 different grades of crude oil. The big one is West Texas Intermediate. It's pretty much good for fucking everything. Okay. Um, then you got Brent Sea, which is from the North Sea around the UK. Um, you got Omani, um, a couple other ones. And then you have what's called Louisiana Heavy Sweet. Louisiana heavy sweet is pretty fucking close to what they were getting from South America for all the Gulf Coast refiners. So certain, like, you'll be watching Fox News or whatever your flavor is. You'll see, the, see them flash the oil price for today. That's WTI. Yep. That's West Texas Intermediate. <clears throat> if you go on an actual, like, commodity site, you'll see all the different prices of all these different grades of oil and where they came from, then you have to build in your shipping costs, all right? So it's cheaper for us because there's a pipeline that literally runs from our platforms directly to the fucking refinery. We don't have to rent a ship. We don't have to rent a crew. We don't have to fight off pirates and all this other stupid shit. And it's, it's all about margins, man. It's the, the refining margin on it isn't what, refineries don't make a whole lot of money yeah like i've seen think. that here in the in the local area one of them i believe is going out of business richmond no it's in benicia mm. i got you um yeah i'm so not 100 percent sure to that i just know that it's not things aren't good over there yeah and like any other business it's all about margins that's all it comes down to um mm. our margin is called loe lease operating expenditure that's how much it costs us to get a barrel of oil out of the ground. If our LOE gets over a certain point, we start getting phone calls from like, not our boss, but our boss's boss's bosses. Um, and you better quit ordering shit and do something and start getting some more oil out of the ground. Um, the big thing that's limiting the U.S. is, <clears throat> as far as being like a world leader in oil production. So, you're in California, right? Yep. There's something like 3.7 billion barrels of oil offshore where you sit right now that they're not allowed to drill for. Off the East Coast, it's about 6 billion barrels, between 5 and 6 billion barrels. The only place we're allowed to drill offshore is the Gulf of Mexico, and we can't drill off of Florida anymore. Um, Florida sits on a shit ton of natural gas. Um, and plus we've gotten rid of a lot of our refining capacity. We used to have refineries all up and down the East coast, like in New Jersey and places like that, New York, Pittsburgh. Um, and it's all, it's come down to a lot of nimbyism. As long as they don't care where their gas from comes from, but it all comes from down here pretty much. Um, and it's, it's, out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. You know, like, they don't care where it comes from as long as it shows up. Oh, yeah. As long as the pump turns on. Correct. 
so is it is it a legal issue or is it just something that we're gonna have to ride out until it becomes well you know what shit now we have to go get it it's a it's a legal issue Mm -hmm. um they like you remember the big hullabaloo about them open up the uh Alaska National Wildlife Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keystone Pipeline and all that shit. Yeah. So imagine that off of California. Imagine trying to drill a well off of California right now. But see, that's what, I mean, I get, I, but I can play, I can, I can see both sides, right? Like, let, let's take the, well, we don't want to have the risk to the sea life and, and all that shit. I got it. But then at the end of the day, these aren't like, you know, Walmart greeter jobs. You're actually supplying actual jobs to your economy. Yes. You know, and I mean, the fifth largest in the world now in California, like, you know, but then again, we have a governor who wants to have, you know, all electric cars by 2035 in a state that literally turns the power off every month. Yeah. And y'all actually have one of the oldest continually operating oil fields in the world in Kern River. And, um, and if you buy California almonds, they're watered by water that that oil company got out of the ground as a byproduct. Really? Well, yes, sir. Yeah. They that's sell water crazy. to the farmers. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause there's also that every time I fly out of LA, I see that big ass refinery that's down there. Yeah. Which I always wonder, like if we have all these refineries and the things you're talking about, like why is gas so fucking expensive here? Aside from the 40 million people that live here, but still. Um, so like right now oil is probably like, between thirty eight and forty two dollars a barrel average. Gas down here right now is about a dollar fifty a gallon. Well, I'm in Northern California and it's anywhere from two seventy nine to three fifty nine, depending well, where you go. Southern California be, is more expensive. That's because y'all have different rules for gasoline. Because of your state. Well, I remember, so I remember in 2016, they passed the gas tax out here. I think it was an extra 12 cents per gallon for California. But not if I take that, that away, I'm still at 273. Well, not just that. There's a specific blend that comes out of the refinery for California and for wow. different areas of California because, okay. of, because of emissions rules. Oh, my God. Jesus. Fucking just, fucking just, just stab me in the head. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I came from Florida and I remember I was like, all right. And, I, and then I, I've been to Southern California a few times to see family and I knew it was damn near twice as much. Northern California, depending where you're at, the gas isn't stupid expensive. But I mean, what you're talking about in Louisiana, my parents in Tennessee, it's, it's super cheap. I also try to think about that though. Is it in relation to cost of living or is it specifically, as you just said, like, certain states have certain blends or, or, or what no i mean it's it's actually the cost of the actual refining gets passed along to the customer just like any other product so right. it, it it costs more to make california legal gasoline so that gets passed on to the customer and plus you'll have a shitload of excise tax and all that bullshit on the gasoline itself um without our state and federal gas taxes here in louisiana it'd be like 80 cents a gallon do you guys have anything to do with like does your day to day operation depend anything on the price of gas or are you solely focused on the cost of getting a barrel of oil out of the ground as you said solely focused on keeping our l o e driven down and getting oil out of the ground as cheaply and safely as possible so what sets a price for a gallon of gas. Why does it vary so much throughout the year? Uh, it's a future. It's a commodity. Okay. Ah, uh, gotcha. Because I've, wa- I've watched this year, and it's it's not like it was last year. And, I, and I'm trying to uh, maybe it has to do with COVID or whatever. And I, I mean, I get what you're saying in terms of a future, but I'm trying to figure out why. Like we had this huge drop, which I assumed was related to COVID and trying to make things cheaper, right? But it's come back pretty co- pretty hard. It's winter yeah. time. Winter all time. your refiner, all your refiners are switching over from making light end products like gasoline to making heavier products like heating oil, kerosene and shit. So there, there's man. only so much refinery to go around. So like right. for every gallon of gasoline, 
you have to account for that's not a gallon of diesel number two or diesel number one or fuel oil or bunker oil or kerosene or avgas, you know. So the that's that's an area I'm really not familiar with because I'm not way above my fucking pay grade. <laughs> yeah, I'll no, trade all that you. shit. But that that's essentially kind of it. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like some big brain shit, which is going to lead me to my next question is, um, you say there's not enough people coming in to replace people like yourself and some of the older guys getting out, but what, what do you, what is the, what's the future in your opinion in terms of fuel? Um, there will always be gasoline and there will always be diesel fuel and there, it, is there a finite rim amount though on the, in, in the world, obviously, or, or theoretically yes because we're we're 2020 i mean obviously they'll exhaust this shit long after we're gone but i mean at some point you got to think they run out right so all right so talking about deep water horizon yeah that well was anticipated to come in at something like seventy five thousand barrels a day by itself that one well is that a lot that is a metric fucking shit (laughs) done okay (laughs) okay (laughs) um so if you took the oil prices that were where they were at the time, they were right around a hundred bucks a barrel in 2010. Yeah. yeah it was pretty so shitty. that's $750,000 a day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. <laughs> but then you have to look at the development costs and drilling costs of these ultra deep water structures. You're looking at like between four and $7 billion to drill, build and set a structure now in deep water. Jesus. But thanks. Fuck. It's a lot of money. It's a it's it's a lot of money. And it takes a little while for these structures to pay for themselves. But I've been on structures that make hundred and fifty thousand barrels a day. And I've been on structures that make a hundred barrels a day. Um it's all depending on what how much the company operating the structure is willing to pay to operate that structure. Are these structures ma- are these structures mobile? No. Um, so once they're there, like, on so you have shelf and deep water. So okay. shelf shelf is actually affixed to the seafloor. Okay. Um, there's one deep water structure that's affixed to the seafloor. It's VK seven eighty six Vias seven eighty six called Petronius. It's like two thousand feet tall. Um, it's a compli- it's a compliant tower. Um, for a long time, it was the largest our tallest freestanding structure that man had ever built. Um, yeah, that's you, fucking 200 stories, right? Can we take? Yeah. That's fucking huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, once you get into deep water, deep water, you have all different types of designs of, of floating yeah. platforms, um, but they're anchored to the seafloor and they actually sit there and move. Yeah. Um, your wellheads, like, you know what a well looks like. Um, the wellheads are actually on the sea floor and it's all controlled by remote technology and all that comes up is an umbilical. They're starting to do like undersea compression now, undersea separation, all five, six, seven, eight thousand feet deep. They're doing all this down there. The technology would boggle people's like some of the stuff in the oil field makes the space program look like Yeah, you know, I would imagine. Like, it's insane, man. There's got to be a huge budget for R and D, right? I mean, because so okay, well, okay, so that's what I want to fix. Get let me get back to it because I said, well, what what is the future in your opinion? And you said there will always be oil, and we went off more on oil, but I mean, they've been running these commercials for years now on fucking what algae and, and some of this other shit. Like, where where do you see a, a viable transition from oil? What do you think? Nothing. The, the, no, because. No, there will never be a viable transition unless we start making like little tiny miniature nuclear reactors for everybody's car. <laughs> Is that feasible? I, that's uh, way above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just from the amount of energy that's contained in like a gallon of gasoline, mm-hmm. it's stupendous when you compare it with everything else. Diesel, all that. Could you imagine? All right, so you're in the Army. Yep. You imagine a all electric tank platoon and how well that would work. Anything that would get rid of tanks, I'm for, as I said earlier today. But no, I don't. I don't see. It. But but that's yeah. the other thing. Like if I 
we go back because they run on what JP eight, I think for the most part. Yeah. Kerosene. Yeah. Those, those, is that what JP eight is really? K- kerosene. Okay. So a fucking, from what I read and this was years, I don't know, maybe it's a little more efficient, but I remember reading something like a, a, a tank can go like eight miles on a gallon. Yeah. If that. I mean, that's, that's not, that's not too bad. I mean, considering I don't think it's good. I mean, eight well, miles, you know what I mean? That's, that's why I'm saying like, is there a reasonable, well, you're pushing around 60 tons. I know that's true. It, it's a fucking, it's a lot of weight and we have a lot of them. Uh, and we ask a lot of them at the times when we need them. That's why I don't think I'm just, I always think like, is this, is this even efficient? Okay. Here's my personal opinion. And this is not based in science or anything. It costs more. It costs the end user more for green energy than if you would have just went old school and burned some coal or burned some natural gas to make it power. Yeah. It costs I mean, way more. Yeah, I've been, I've, I've read that for years and that's why I'm just, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on the, the green movement and the, and the, the, the politics and the, the radicalism behind it. I mean, I get it. I've read enough of it. You, you may have, or you may haven't, but either way you work in this industry and you know a hell of a lot more than a layman like myself. myself. But w- w- we have to assume that there's some legit effort being put into transition, right? right. Or no? It's being put, that effort is being made by the super major oil companies because they get a tax break on it. Yeah, because you know who I mean, the largest manufacturer of solar panels up until very recently was British Petroleum. Oh, the whole uh, Deepwater Horizon guys, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> the leader in geothermal technology right now is Chevron. And so in your opinion, how, like, what, what's the, what's the viability of a solar panel long-term? Not going to happen. Is it because they can't figure out a way to make enough energy from it? Or is it just. Because if they built enough solar panels to power the United States, like 70% of China would die because it's a fucking horribly disgusting, dirty industry. And that's where solar panels, really? Yes. It, Why? They use toxic shit to make them. Okay. Um, they're like, <clears throat> I forget the article, but there's like entire dead cities in China where this shit is manufactured, like where nothing grows. It looks like a fucking apocalypse. Um, looks like a video game. Yeah. And <clears throat> you got to go back to like what you're willing to put up with. I mean, like, so like, yeah, you might be able to power like so my house, for instance. Right, yeah, I can right. put enough solar panels on here to power this house. But that's gonna be an initial outlay of probably seventy grand, right? To get it all set up. Yep. You know how many power bills I can pay with seventy thousand dollars? Probably, <laughs> probably, probably the rest die. of your life, most likely. Yeah. yeah. Probably yeah. till I die, for real. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I don't think these people are doing like a, a legitimate cost benefit analysis on all this. And they're they're all like well, this climate change, this climate change, climate change. Okay, what the fuck ever, climate change aside. Um, a lot of that shit you people are calling climate change is just horrible decisions made by your purported leaders. I mean, like half your state is on fire. That's, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know. It just fucking relit up again tonight. Or not tonight, but over the weekend. Yeah. And personally, I don't think that's climate change. I think that's horrible forest oh, management. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors, but I think that's part of it. Absolutely. And I mean, what did they predict in 1970 that would be in an ice age by 1990? And then in 1990, they did predicted that New York would be underwater by 2000. And, you know, it's, I don't know. I understand that burning hydrocarbons is probably not the greatest for the environment, but that's what keeps my lights on and what keeps my head. Yeah. In <clears throat> and it's one hell of a fuel. Right. So, I mean, I've been fortunate this based on my, you know, time in the service to experience a, a ton of, I've been to 21 different countries, but I remember where the fuck was I? It might've been Romania or somewhere over there in fucking Europe. And I, I just remember, and I see it now out in California, but not to the extent, but there's these massive wind farms, you know, there's these huge wind. Um, what, what is it? What is, what is your take on that as a, a viable power source because <laughs> you know we're, we're talking about wind and 
and, and solar. They, like, these are perpetual things. They'll never go away. They're always going to be there in the environment um, until the sun engulfs us all and we're not here anymore anyway. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the oil is, and I, I, I think oil is finite at some point in, in, you know, yeah, we have all these reserves that we can't touch because of laws, but eventually laws can be changed. But what do you think in terms of the solar or not the solar, but the, the wind aspect? I mean, there, I've, I've heard conflicting things on wind, like from the environmental side, I've heard they kill a shit ton of birds and stuff like that, of migratory birds. Um, on the other hand, if the wind ain't blowing, you ain't got no power. Um, mm -hmm. It's still lubricated by oil, though. I know, that's what's crazy. It's like, people don't realize that this shit is still, whatever it is, like, you still got to have the fucking, the oil or the coal and all that stuff to go into it to power this shit. So that's my thing with, uh, like, what is it? Everyone's got this, like, Tesla's a massive fucking industry out here, but, you know, these batteries, where do they fucking come from? I mean, <laughs> it's... Uh, like, I, so... Electricity requires what? Cold, motive. right? Right. <laughs> no, it 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 requires motive force or or converting solar power to okay. energy. So you either got to burn something, turn mm -hmm. something, or be in the sun. <laughs> so I mean, we got a lot of fucking sun out here, but still, not <clears throat> enough. I, I I think Tesla's a very cool idea. I oh, I love I, it. I love the. Th I love. I love Elon Musk, but I think the applications are are going to be very limited because I mean, how long does it take to charge like a Tesla three? Like, yeah, no, my buddy in the office has one and he, he says it's anywhere from like 35 to 45 minutes. Yeah. Fuck that. I can, exactly. Exactly. I can fill up that Chevy yeah. outside in like fucking five minutes yeah, and drive like, another 450 miles. Right. When I drive to my brothers in Southern California, we take I five and, I think there's like two stations now that I see with, you know, Tesla charging stations on, on rest stops. For the most part, they're still non-existent on like major highways. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't it, think I've ever seen one down here. No. They're and that, well, that's the thing. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there's a ton of them out here starting to see more and more pop up, especially in some of the less than desirable areas of like Vallejo. Like I don't want to fucking sit for 45 minutes in Vallejo. This is not a good idea. Um, but yeah, I was, I was always wondering that cause I never saw a Tesla cause I, I was in Florida before this, never saw one there. Yeah. Never. And I mean, just like for me personally, so how would that make sense for me? Like hurricane pops up. Well, my Tesla yeah. ain't all the way fucking charged. There's no yeah. way to charge it after I get 350 miles down the road, but and the power is gone. And the, yeah, power is going to be gone. So because they're not like a Prius, you don't get a backup with gas. Yeah. I mean, and I, like some of the stuff that Elon Musk has come up with is fucking amazing. Um, just personally for me and my family, like the whole electric car thing would just never be a thing. Cause I have to like tonight, I'm going to drive 225 miles to go to work. And next week when I get home, I might have to pull a 6,000 pound camper, you know, God yeah. knows where I don't, I don't see doing that with, the the fucking whatever the hell he calls his truck thing. yeah i was about to say you're not you're not you're not on the the waiting list for the the tesla truck yeah no i no, think it's fucking no, ugly as <laughs> yeah it looks like <laughs> it looks like the warthog from halo i think it's exactly yeah oh <laughs> god it's so ugly though man like it, no but i get wrong. that and then i think a lot of these great ideas are lost in the fact that you know there's a there's a very big country out there who yeah. doesn't want to live in the city, who doesn't want to be subjected to the city, who doesn't want to be subjected to the, the things that mayors who only take into account the city livers. And, uh, you know, that, that's fucking average, hard working fucking America. Coon asses like yourself. Damn. That's right. Right. I mean, that's what I'm trying to get that to really get at is, uh, Man, we really dig deep into the weeds on this stuff, and it's and it's it's the main reason why we had why I think the founders were so uh, they were so brilliant in their foresight, and why we had the electoral college and all. Because you know what, no one in fucking San Francisco needs to dictate how Demp in Southern Louisiana lives his fucking life. Yeah, just that's like, my opinion. Uh, just like 
I have no idea your way of life. So why should I be in charge of you? Right. And that's, that's supposed to be the root of the American experiment is individualism, right? Like we do what we fucking have the freedom to do as long as it doesn't, you know, morally or legally inflict upon someone else. Hopefully. Right. right? Um, but yeah, man, I mean, like, God, I learned a fucking ton. I wanted to go back to something. Can you give me a hazing story or are you not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Demp's hazing. Cause I got a great baseball college hazing story one day I got to tell, but anyway, let, let, let's get some Demp hazing in here. 22 years in. So a big thing used to be, so you, do you know what pipe dope is? I don't. You know what never sees is? I don't know anything, man. <laughs> okay. So like <laughs> pipe dope and never sees are like a lubricant with never sees is a lubricant with little flakes of nickel in it, which aids in it. And if you get like this much on your finger, your entire body will be covered very shortly because that's just the way it works. It's you it's the most hateful shit ever. <laughs> so Pipe dope is very similar, except it has a little bit of copper in it. A big thing used to be to dope the new guys betwixt. Betwixt. Second time that word's been used tonight. You're welcome, America. Keep going. <laughs> and that, that, that used to be a thing. And uh, it would take like days and days and days and days for you to get all the pipe dope out of your area. Um, uh, let's see. Then we had the we used to have the crabs test, um, <sighs> just shit like that. Um, turtle fucking, turtle fucking is a thing offshore. What <laughs> is it exactly how it sounds? <clears throat> well, it's it's not so much hazing, but like, um, you see a guy, he's got his hard hat on. You ask him like if he's new, be like, hey, you know what it sounds like when turtles fuck. They're like no, so you take your heart and you go, <laughs> you, you hit him on the head with it. Um, we'll send guys looking for shit that doesn't exist. Like, um, go find me a bucket of head joints. Yeah, it's in the warehouse. Um, go look, go look for the sky hook, shit like that. Um, go paint the Humvees with the invisible paint. We give them a bucket full of water. Yeah, yeah, shit like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of the more like stuff that is technically illegal now <laughs> um <laughs> uh yeah we're not gonna talk about it <laughs> um we've all they, been there no that's good though man like i think it you know what i get like no trust me and i know you said you, you you touched on it originally um there are some things that don't belong in the hazing world but i think overall hazing does serve a purpose you know you're you're trying to as the new person you're trying to ingrain yourself to who you're trying to work with, but then you're also trying to, as you said, uh, find out who really wants to be there. Yeah. You know, and I get like, look, there's, there's some lines that have always been wrong. Like I, I went, I went to play baseball in college and my, my, our freshman initiation was, uh, something I would not wish upon pretty much anybody, but there was love behind it. And if I really pull it back, you know, it wasn't designed to, to hurt. It may have, but it just, it wasn't designed to hurt. Um, so I think, I think there is a, there is a value to hazing. I think the words kind of took it on a negative connotation over the years. Um, but I mean, Hey, that's where we're at. That's a good story, man. I, 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 I'm curious to learn how turtles fuck. So let me see if I got anything else on here for the demp tonight. Uh, I wanted to go back. Let, let me get right back into your, your medical thing for a little bit. And then we'll, we'll get you out of here, man. Cause I know Demp's got to go to work. He's got to go get us oil. So, Oh, that, that, that's a question I wanted to ask. So how much oil is on average brought out of the ground a day? Like, like where, like in the, well, where you're at, where you're at. Yeah. So let's go with where you're at. So my field, we make about like, 8,000 barrels a day. And how many gallons of gasoline will that become? Mm, I think a barrel of oil makes like 13 gallons of gas. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. 13. So 8,000 times 13, 72. So about 100,000. 
Yeah. yeah. But like Eastern Gulf of Mexico region, if everybody's on the line, you're probably looking at like, because you got Devil's Tower, Perdido on line of faith, Tahiti, Appomattox, uh, shit. You got all these deep water shit. You're probably looking at like 300,000 barrels a day in the Eastern region. All right, well, so let's do a trivia question for those listening at home, which I guess everybody would be doing. But how much gallon? How many gallons of gas does the United States purchase per year? We don't. We don't buy finished product. We don't. Oh, I thought you meant like as a government. Type no, 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 no. I meant like so. The, so me, me going to the gas pump, and and everyone like me. How many? How oh. many gallons do we do a year do you know shit i have no idea i, I need to know. google this shit all right so i'm gonna google this because this is gonna be a great real-time google experiment how many gallons of gas does demp get for us per year how many gallons of gas does america buy a year oh look at that it's already done for me 140.43 billion gallons so you're doing 8,000 gallons a day of, man, it hurts my head. Cause like, are these drums recyclable? Cause <laughs> are these barrels, <laughs> I just, a lot of barrels out there, man. It, just, it well, sounds no. like a lot. So the only reason we barrel, so a drum is 55 gallons. A right, barrel right. is 42 gallons. And ah. the, only, and the okay. only reason we barrel measure oil in barrels, like such as we do is a carryover from the whaling industry back in the gap because a uh, barrel of whale oil was 42 gallons. So that's why we have 42 gallons of oil in a barrel. And for those who don't know, a barrel of bourbon in the United States, when it gets barreled and aged, is 53 gallons. And wine, oh, I know this because I just learned this. I'm an idiot. It's either 59 or 60. This is very useful. You need this. You need to know this. Dent, when you get to work tonight, you need to tell this. Yeah, I was 60. All right, and then there's 60 gallons in a barrel of wine. So if we're, we're aging wine, we got 60 gallons. If we're aging bourbon, it's 53. Nice. Write this shit down, America. This is knowledge. It's free. <laughs> All you got to do is sit here and listen to us speak. <coughs> um, damn, what? Did, did I have anything else for you, man? All right, go ahead. And, you want to plug this medical company or this, uh, this company of yours, Soltec? Solitec? Yeah, so if you're looking for – good kid at a decent price and we're not going to fuck over you. It's <laughs> solatac.com. S O L A T A C.com. Yep. And you, and you know what? You got to understand you can never have enough of good equipment that is actually reasonably priced. And if you, as Dem said, or if you start Googling and, and you, you want to start your prepper endeavors, you're going to, you're going to run into a lot of obstacles, primarily a lack of availability and price. Um, and unfortunately that's just the time that we're in all bad things shall pass. I'm still waiting for bourbon prices to come back down. Uh, I assume ammo will appear again and so will weapons or guns. Uh, but hopefully. if they don't, Hey, hopefully you got them. I do. Yeah. just not in this state. So <laughs> figure that shit out but uh all right debt man i appreciate you joining me tonight man uh hope you have a solid safe next two weeks is that what you got you guys yeah. got wi-fi out there what the fuck fuck yeah man all right you gonna be on on wednesday i'm gonna try all right that's the right answer i mean and again like i said you, you are more than welcome to join us in watching this debate tomorrow but if not i i wish you a productive and safe journey out to the deep water dump all right man be safe all right brother thanks for coming on see you later man.